Well, let's pray. You remember the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, revert sins. Those would be three categories. We'll talk about one of them tonight, sins of the tongue. One of the simplest ways you correct it, at least on the surface side, on the spiritual side, is to confess your sin. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That takes care of the sin problem. It may not take care of the root cause of your sin, you know, uh, the manifestation of it, but it will take care of spirituality, take care of the sin nature, won't take care of the choices you make and the reasons you make them. Hopefully, the Bible doctrine of spiritual growth correct that. But So I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest to confess sin if necessary. It would be necessary uh, to have a spiritual input from the Holy Spirit on the Word of God. That would be good. He's the Spirit of truth. Remember John 14, 15, 16. He's the Spirit of truth. That's his great ministry to the believer. Our Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way to study with us out of the book of James, the fifth chapter, verse 9, specifically tonight. Sins of the tongue that have been set loose among the church. And just like the children of Israel, it causes a lot of grief. And it doesn't matter if the sins of tongue are directed towards the leadership of the church or within the body of Christ towards one another, as James talks about. It's not appropriate for a healthy church. So encourage your hearts tonight, Father, as we look at the subject matter on sins of the tongue within the church. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> what was going on? The lights off at that time. Well, you're just in the lights tonight, aren't you? <laughs> I've heard more about lights from you than I think I've I've heard in 45 years. Um what helpful is good, and I thank you for it. Uh, James deals with this with this problem. I mean, he deals with it to the judgment of it, rather maybe the spiritual solution. So we're going to look at James, uh, and then we're going to look at maybe some ways we could understand what's going on and how we could correct it in our life or in the life of a church. As, as we know around here. Uh, Sins of the tongue are one of three categories of sins that that uh, hinder fellowship and unity and things within the body of Christ as well as in the, as how it affects individuals. You know the wonderful thing about it, if you can learn to correct mental attitude sins, not only do, does is it healthy for the church, but it's healthy for your marriage. It's help, helpful for your family, for your business. I mean it. Once you learn this, it just goes across all lines, and it, it's a marvelous thing. Uh, you know, I'm just dealing with one of it. If you can correct it in any one area of your life and take it, then you understand how you can take it to other areas of your life. Uh, that's a wonderful thing. I know it has been for me. Uh, so the sense of tongue is one of three. We, we talk about sins of the tongue. We talk about overt sins. We talk about mental attitude sins. And uh, in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 20 and 21, Paul's having this problem with the church of Corinth. <laughs> uh, they, everybody has problems with this until it can be corrected and people can begin to intervolve in sp spirituality. You know, it's not healthy when everybody else has to correct you. It's, it's, it's healthy when you can correct yourself. Right? I mean, that's the wonderful thing. And, and listen, you know, you know one of the fruit of the Spirit, one of the fruit is self-control. That would be a wonderful thing, wouldn't it? I mean, that's supernatural. That's not asking you to do it. It's asking you to let him do it. Think about that. I mean, that's a, that's a powerful idea. It's been a powerful idea in my life. 
But in 2 Corinthians 12, 20 through 21, later you'll look at it. He lists, he lists 10 sins that disrupt and hurt a church. Paul does. In that group, when you look at that group, <clears throat> I picked out three of them that fit sins of the tongue. Now, all these are going to fit that category, sins of the tongue, overt sins, mental attitudes, and when you look at them. <clears throat> but I picked out quarreling. Uh, in that in that group, quarreling, slander, and outburst of anger. <clears throat> the outburst of anger. We've all probably been privy to that type of thing. <clears throat> but in that group of of ten that Paul lists, he mentions three of them there that are connected to our our study tonight. Other sins of the tongue that I might mention to you would be such things as maligning backbiting, judging, grumbling, complaining, uh, gossiping, gossiping. That's listed. I think that's listed for our list. I think the fourth one listed in 2 Corinthians there is gossiping. I, don't, I didn't put it down. <laughs> but these are additional sins of the tongue. Uh, destructive criticism, lying, flattering for self-gain. You know, these are things, the reason they're so dangerous is they tear down, they don't build up. The whole idea in the body of Christ, working with one another in the church, is to build one another up, not to tear one another down. Building one another up is what makes a healthy marriage, family, church, business, you know, all the divine institutions that you could think of. In our lesson text, what James does is really interesting that Paul doesn't do. What James does is he introduces this problem with a standing negative command. A negative command is, is going to have either the negative make or ook. This is a word in the, that's the Greek. In the English, we say it not or don't if you put a do not. Do not. And that's the way James uses it here. <clears throat> the word complaining, uh, stenezo, that is used in the Greek language. I put it on your paper. Now watch this. It's a present active imperative, second person plural. On your paper, that's a P-A-I-M-P-V. That's a present tense, an active voice, and an imperfect mood, second person plural, with the negative me or may. See that on your paper? So, you translate it into present tense, you say stop, or we might say don't in the English, or do not. It's a negative, and what's important to pay attention to that in the Greek language, second person plural, he's talking about a group, second person plural, <laughs> y'all. So you all, James is talking about the church body, the body of Christ, and how destructive it can be within it. And there's a long history in Israel about that with the children of Israel coming out of the Exodus and that whole business. In fact, the writer of Hebrews devotes two chapters to it to correct it in the church. The book of Hebrews, chapter 3 and 4, he devotes those two chapters to this subject. <laughs> um, so... Uh, what he uses is what we call a standing command. A standing command, listen to me now, a standing command is a present imperative. That's a standing command. That command, present tense, this always applies. He puts it in the negative, don't, or stop and don't. This, it, it would come up like that. This must stop and never occur again. This must stop now and not, and not go on. We've probably been in conversations like that, right? People have had it with us or we've had it with other people. This has got to stop and not continue. And it usually has or else. And this one has here. He says, because the judge is standing at the door. And, and we know what he's talking about. He's talking about the Lord in this regard. And he's talking about his coming back. Jesus didn't come to be a judge. He made that very clear. 
when every time he addressed who he was, he said, I didn't come to judge. I came to deliver. Okay? I didn't come to, didn't come to judge. I'll come the second time to judge. That's not why I come the first time. The sin of the, to the, sin of the tongue attacks the harmony and the unity of fellowship and the ministry, the outflow of the ministry of the church. See, that's why, that's why it's, a, it's a destructive thing. Now, this, this would be true with, uh, but verbal sins attack people. See, S stop complaining, what? Against one another. So, I mean, these are, the, this, the, so the sins of the tongue uh, and, uh, and a lot of time overt sins affect other people. Against, this word against is, is a prepositional phrase, uh, against one another. It, what is interesting about this word, it's kata, the word against, in the Greek language is kata plus the genitive of opposition. Now, you know it's the genitive of opposite. See, what the genitive does in the Greek language, I, I suppose in all languages, but what it does in the Greek language, it, it's called direction. It's, a genitive can be used in many different ways. It's usually translated of, but not necessarily. Here, the word kata, down, uh, is used with the genitive to say against. Uh, you're complaining, you're attacking one another with your tongue. You're attacking one another with your tongue. Um, used like a weapon. Your tongue can be used like a weapon. Right? We've seen that, right? We've had that in our life. It, it should be from somebody that, quote, loves you. But against... The genitive plus the uh, genitive, the genitive in this case is what we call directional. It could be relational. It could be used in several different ways, but we call it directional, and it's with a negative, so it's in opposition. Are you with me? I'm just telling you why this word is translated in English against, and, and it's a wonderful translation, and I don't think any of us missed it, <laughs> the word against. I'm just telling you how it was developed. And it's talking about where the sin of the tongue is used as a, as a weapon against you. It's being used against you. It's being used against one another <clears throat> like, a, like a weapon. Now, the word one another is a, a reciprocal pronoun. It's a reciprocal pronoun. And that's interesting, too. It's a reciprocal pronoun. So I'm going to tell you what a reciprocal pronoun, pronoun means in the Greek language and how it applies to this passage in a very unique way. This A-L-L-E-L-O-N -L -L -E comes from the Greek root word alas. You see the A-L-L-O-S is the word alas. In the Greek language, they have two for one for another. It could be alas or heteros. Well, heteros means one of a different kind. That's a dog and that's a cat. Alas means we're the same kind. They're both dogs. One's a shepherd and one's something else. Okay? They're both dogs, but now we can get technical of what kind of dog they are. Then we get further technical with it. So when he says that you're attacking one another, they're talking about that, and, and we know who it is because it's vocative. See the word brethren? That's who he's addressing. See, that's a vocative. <clears throat> they, that, that's who he's addressing, the brethren, the believers in Christ with him. The brethren, the, the brothers who are, who's, have the same father. They belong to the same family. God is their father. And so that's, that's kind of interesting. Now, here's what a reciprocal, and I'll show you how it's applied and why, why it's used. In the grammar rule of reciprocal pronouns, 
a plural subject like the brethren is represented as affected by an interchange of actions signified in the verb, you must never complain or stop doing that. Don't complain against one another. And who is he talking to? The brethren. You have a reciprocal pronoun when the plural subject, brethren in this case, is represented as affected by the interchange of actions signified in the verb, do not complain, against one another. Now, you can see all of that, I suppose, in the English, but it's laid out. Here is a problem we have in the church. Here's what's going on, and here's the solution. And if it's not, then let me tell you how this is going to be resolved. You're going to meet the judge at the door. When he comes back, you're going to meet the judge. You're going to go before the judgment seat of Christ as a believer, and you're going to give an account of your behavior and actions as a believer. Those that have not been covered by the blood, if they're covered by the blood, then they're forgotten. Agreed? They're erased. Nobody is going to be punished for their sin because sin has already been dealt with by Christ at the cross. These have affected the way you have manifested your relationship with Christ to other people, especially those in the church. That's what James is talking about because he, he goes like, look, if these are not correct and dealt with, you're going to have to deal with them with the, with the, before the judge. Do you understand what he's saying? The judge is at the door. The, you're going to have to deal with this stuff with the judge. Deal with it now when I'm your advocate to tell you to clean up the mess. Right? I mean, at least that's, I, I'm assuming that's where James is taking this because his solution is to tell him, clean it up because the judge is standing at the door and we don't know when he's knock. We don't know when he's coming back. They, all these guys, just like me, believe it's going to come in their lifetime. Okay. They all believed it. They all believed it. They all believed they were in the last days. And John, when he writes 1 John, he says, I think we're in the last hour of the last day. <clears throat> So I'm just telling you how James, now, this against one another is a prepositional phrase. It's a prepositional phrase describing the attack of the sin of the tongue. And clean them up now. Get, get these things confessed and get your life back on track and stop doing that, James is saying, because you're going to meet the judge and give account of this. <laughs> not account of your salvation, not account of but account but account of why you are saved and not behaving right. Apparently, that's what he's saying. All right? It is to me. The judge stands at the door. <laughs> I mean, what judge is this going to be? Well, this is the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Second, Second Corinthians 10, uh, 5, 10, uh, R Romans 14, 10. I mean, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, not for condemnation, but for rewards or for no rewards, right? I mean, if, if you're not familiar with this, then you should write on your paper, 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, 10 through, I don't know, 15 or something. And the other passages I met, and you should pay attention to 2 Corinthians 5, 10. You should pay attention to Romans 14, 10. These are passages that deal with this, along with, what, along with this one, which is James 5, 9. And I think... That it's Revelation 3.10, behold, three something. Maybe somebody could hunt that for me. It's three something. It's either 3.10 or 20. And in my mind, I can't, I can't decide which one of those. And so when you get it, 3.20, 3.20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's, that's the idea that James is laying out here, in my opinion. Uh, now, I want to look at four things about the sin of the tongue tonight. J uh, Paul addresses, we've just looked at Corinthian church. Now, now we're going to look at the church at Philippi. The, church, the Philippian church, the church at Philippi, 
Paul addresses them and, and, and tries to show them how to correct some of this. So I want you to look in your Bibles, if you would. We're at James. Let's back up a little bit to the book of Philippians. We're going to look at the second chapter, verses 14 through 16, where Paul deals with this. And uh, you can kind of see a di how, how the guys, how they, how they kind of approach it and yet deal with it in the same kind of way. Uh, here's what Paul does in verse 14. He says, do all things without grumbling and disputing. I'll come back to that. That you may prove yourself, this is so important to the day of judgment, to the, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Blameless, that's really important. Here is going to be some of the rules by which you're going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Here's what Paul is laying out. He's, he's laying out how you're going to be judged there. Blameless, one. Blameless, innocent, children of God, that's three. Above reproach, four. Of a, uh, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, you didn't buy into what everybody else is doing. Well, everybody else is doing it, so I might as well do it. Among whom, you know, I, you see this every time there's a rebellion in the streets of America. One person breaks in a store and runs in and comes out with a bunch of stuff. First thing you know, the whole community is running in and coming out with a whole bunch of stuff. Right? Well, I'm just saying, one person busts in, first thing you know, everybody, I'm, I'm talking about the hoodlums, you know. My point is, don't do that. Don't do that. The point is, just because everybody else is attacking one another with their tongue, don't do that. Well, they did it to me. Don't do that. In the midst of a crooked, listen, blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights. That's our, that's our next one. Lights in the world. You know, I love this about Joseph because he was a wonderful light for God, for Christ, in the world. When you study his life like we are, he's just a wonderful example of a guy. He's thrown in a pit. He's not like the pit. He's thrown in Potiphar's. He's not like Potiphar. He's thrown in prison. He's not like prison. He, he stays consistent with who he is in Christ. He never, he, never, he never takes on wherever the conflict is. He never lets it get to him, and he becomes that. Well, you hit me, I'm hitting you. He doesn't do that. He stays steadfast in the Lord. He never lets the world cause him to be somebody that he's not in Christ. He's a wonderful example of this as a teenager. He never did it. And he was always in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. It seemed like God just sent him. Why? Why was he always there? Because he was God's light and God sent him where it's dark. Right? That's why when we all gather, we're a bright light. When we go apart, we're single, we have, we're just flashlights. We can light up a room together. But when we walk away and we all go our separate ways, we're a flashlight. And listen, that's an important deal. We're a light. When we go back to that home and people don't love God, we're still the light. And it's important that we be a light whether as a group or individual, that we be the light of the world. What's wonderful is when we come together like this, we're, we're, uh, we're all the same type of lights with the same interest, the same mindset. When we leave, we're those people individually. We are, the, we are the light of the world wherever our six feet is. That's a wonderful thing. 
But if you're, if you're fighting like this inside the church and amongst one another, imagine what it's going to be where there's a lot of light. Imagine what it's going to be like when they leave there the, and go into a real dark place in their life. They go back into their community of darkness. They go back into their home of darkness. They're dealing with people who are in darkness, who don't have a love for God. You must never become, reflect that darkness. You never, never become. Listen, you were saved out of darkness into light. Be that light. Never let anybody turn your light off so that you can live in darkness because you know that's not true in your soul. You have to turn that light off. See, an unbeliever don't have a light and he can't turn a light on. But as a believer, the light of Christ, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. You are the children of that light. Only you, only you can turn it off. Don't go live in darkness and say, well, the only way I can live, I have to live like darkness. That's not true. Now, I love that about Joseph. He never gained that. No matter, no matter where he was thrown into darkness, he was the light. That's what Paul is talking about. He says, do, do, and so he says in verse 16, now remember, here, here they are. My Bible actually underlined these. Blameless, innocent, children, um, above reproach, um, among whom you appear as lights in the world. That's another one. Holding fast the word of life. Holding fast. Boy, does that, in the Greek, he hit it right on the head. Holding fast. You know what holding fast is? Is some, you've got, you've got your whole paycheck in your purse, and somebody's trying to snatch that purse. Let me tell you, it depends on how valuable that money is in that purse, how much you hold on to that purse. And somebody said, well, you should have given it to them. You get, yeah, but who's going to pay my rent? Who's going to feed my kids? Listen, I might as well be dead and not go home with that money. You see, that may not be true, but I'm just saying, this whole fast is a really strong word. It's a really strong word. Hold fast. The word of life, that, watch this now, watch. He's going to take you to the same place but a different way. That in the day of Christ, see, that's the same guy as judge at the door. That the day of Christ, I may have cause to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. Isn't that wonderful? Now, when the judgment seat of Christ, when that day of Christ or the judge shows up, here are the things that he's going to look at. And Paul is talking to the Corinthian church this way. And what do they have a problem with? Grumbling and disputing. You know what they are? They're sins of the tongue. We, we find, listen, there was no churches that didn't have to work their way through all this stuff. And they're, work, they're trying to get them to work their way through it. Right now, notice on your paper in Philippians two fourteen, it's a positive standing command. It's the same thing. It's a present. It's a present active imperative, second person plural. But watch, it doesn't have the negative. No negative. That makes that a pos a standing positive command. It's just the difference the way the men approach their problem. They both have the same problem. They approach it different. Here's Paul's idea. Paul's idea, don't do this. This is an easy fix now. It won't be an easy fix later when the judge stands at the door or when the day of the Lord comes, when glory ought to be there, when it should be a celebration, a wonderful event. For some, it, they will shy back in shame and all that at, the, at this. Saved, yeah. It's just the way they approach it. One approach is that with a positive idea of solution. 
and the other goes like, the hammer's going to fall on you. <laughs> They're both right. They just approach it different. That's why people love the teaching of Paul. They just love it. I mean, he just, I think he just came from a place in his soul where he was the chief of sinners and just so appreciative of great salvation that the grace of God was such a powerful tool in his life that he just would work with people to the nth degree to make sure they could let grace do a great work in their life. And, or, and he always approached it with a positive attitude, not a negative. That's Paul. And, and so mo for most of us, we just, we just love the way Paul approaches problems with, that people have, just like this one. And, and then the second thing Paul does, because he's always after doctrinal solutions, he gives two reasons. In, in verses 15 and 16, Paul issues two doctrinal reasons for obeying, obeying the positive command. Stop doing this, you know. He's saying, do not grumble. Don't let it, don't even let it happen. He, he doesn't say stop doing it. He says, don't, don't, it, be positive. Don't do these things because they have negative, negative effects on people. So here's the first reason he says, so that, now remember, do all things, do all things without, do all, do all things with, with, you know, do all things without, okay? Do all things without. Now, the word all things, notice that's plural. You go, well, you should live, you ought to live in my home, you couldn't do that. <laughs> you ought to work where I work and you couldn't do that. Well, Paul says, yeah, that you must do this because you're light in the world. You're the light in your home. You're the light at, at work. You're the light. Well, I don't know that I am. Yeah, you are. The Word of God says you are. The Word of God says you are. <laughs> you saved? Yes. Well, then you're the light of God. <laughs> this is, this is not, that's, not, that's not a choice you can make. That's the reality of it. So that so that you will prove yourself to be, all of that's one verb, you, pr you will prove yourself to be, it's the word get on my, it's an aristotle subjunctive. <laughs> you will prove yourself to be is, one, is the whole verb. You will prove, and it's get on my. So that you will prove yourself to be, and then he lists them, blameless, innocent, children of God, above reproach, lights in the world. Then he gives a second reason, watch for this, and he continues, he continues out of the first reason, holding fast the word of God of life, and then he gives a second reason, which is so that I just had to bring them down into verses, so that in the day of Christ, see, why do I do that? Why are these five things he listed important? Because the judgment seat of Christ is the day. The day is coming. The day of the the day of Christ is coming. But he just approaches it a different way. Listen, let's get prepared for the Lord's coming. Let's get prepared for the Lord's coming. How do we prepare ourselves? Let's be blameless. Let's be innocent, right? Let's be children of God above reproach. Let's be lights in the world. Let's hold fast the word of life. These are all the ways that you're going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. How well you executed these things that were manifesto, at, right? Manifesto in the Christian way of life. Look, look, I can't help it. Look, I can hear somebody say on the Internet, I've never heard anything like this. I, I, never, look, I can't help what. I'm so tired of hearing that. I just, I can't help it that you've never heard this before. You're hearing it now. I mean, right? I mean, I, I, well, I, I don't even know how to answer people and say I've never heard this before. You know it, it, I, don't, I don't care if you never heard it before, you're hearing it now. You're hearing it from now, right out of the Word of God. Not, that's, I didn't create this idea. I didn't come up with it. I just studied it. I found it in Paul, and Paul is talking about the same thing James is talking about, and they're talking about the same problem. They're just approaching it a little bit different. But they both got the same idea, the day of Christ. When the judge stands the door and knocks, man. And so, listen, Here's what's going to happen when you stand there, and you might as well get prepared for it. You're going to be judged on whether you were blameless, innocent, 
as a child of God above reproach, lights in the world, and holding fast the word of life. That's how it's going to come down. All right? Well, I didn't make this up. I could have made this up if I would have made it easier on myself. I'd have found a back door here somewhere. Okay. I they, see, the, first Peter 2, 9. I, I, I love this idea that, Paul, that Peter gives. Peter says that we've been called out of darkness, right? We've been called out of darkness. That, that, that's before you were saved, you lived in darkness. I don't care if you went to church before you went saved. I don't care if you was a religious leader like Paul before you got saved. You can, you can have your doctorate in theology and not be saved like Paul. You can be a top official in the church and, or in the synagogue and not be saved. Dear hearts, you got to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, or you'll never get saved no matter how religious you are. It doesn't matter if you're Billy Graham or the Pope or anybody else. you got to come into the kingdom the same way. You're not born in it. You're not elected in it. You're not voted in it. You're called out of darkness. Listen to this now. You're called out of darkness. You're invited to come out of darkness through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ the gospel is an invitation to come out of darkness and to live into light, not only in time but eternity. Let me tell you, if you die without Christ, you die in darkness, and when you go to the next place you're headed in the life after death, it'll be darkness as you've never known it. You'll go from darkness to darkness. And if you're born again, you will go from light to light. And he says in 1 Peter 2, 9, you've been called out of darkness. Listen to this. I love this. Into his marvelous light. Into his marvelous light. Light. I love that. I love that. In Ephesians 2 8, you were formerly in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. I told our people the other day, you need to pay attention to the word walk. There's seven walks that are key to the Christian life. Seven walks. I'll do a study on that one day because I can see you go like, well, I don't know. I'll give you a couple of passages, not on your paper, but you might write them down. Uh, you, you, you all know this one, John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Everybody knows that one, I suppose. But here's one you may have missed, John 9, 5. Now, John 9, 5. Now, my second point, the sin... This, the sins of the tongue can be developed from either carnal thinking, which is self-gratification of pleasure. Uh, I want my way. You know, here, here would be my way or the highway. You know, that's a common thing that people talk. It could come from carnal thinking where as self-interest is, is dominating your life. Or it could come by a backdoor called old man cosmos diabolicus thinking which is a whole system that you have developed about what you believe and don't believe. About how she should behave and how you should deal with life and people and stuff like that. I mean, if you got slaved later in life, you probably grew up with a whole system of how to combat with people. Right? I was taught, I was taught how to fight. I was taught how to fight with my mouth and my hands and my feet and anything I could pick up. Huh? Then you come to Christ and he goes like, oh, wait, 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 wait. We don't fight that way here. We fight, but we don't fight that way. We don't fight that way. So it's a, for some, it, it's a real big, but we all come with something. 
We call it baggage. You know, people call it all kinds of things. An example of sin of tongue, of uh, how a, a sin of a tongue uh, can affect an assembly body of believers was the Exodus. The Exodus generation that came out of Egypt, that they're known as the grumbling, murmuring, complaining generation. Murmur. Murmur. <laughs> what a funny... What a funny word that is, isn't it? Murmur. But you know what? We know when somebody says you're murmuring, we know what they mean, don't we? They're not talking about stuttering. Murmur. Murmur is like dripping water, isn't it? Dripping water. Listen to this. This is Exodus 16.3. It's a powerful verse. Uh, the writers are going to use this idea out of Ephesians, uh, out of Exodus 16, in in writing Hebrews 3 and 4. They say, the sons of Israel, the son of Israel said to them, the, uh, the the son of the son of Israel said to them, the spiritual leaders of them, that be Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Would, we would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the pot of meat, when we ate bread to the full, now you've brought us out here into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. They, they actually thought Moses led them out. M Moses didn't lead them out of Egypt. God led them out of Moses. M Moses couldn't have, listen, Moses couldn't have done 10 those 10 miracles. He stood at the Red Sea, he proved it, proved it, stood at the Red Sea, Red sea and, and called upon God to open it. He understood. <laughs> it is a group of people, they thought Moses did it. And Jesus catches them in John the sixth chapter about manna and corrects them. They said, well, Moses gave us manna. He said, Moses gave you nothing. I gave you nothing. You gave, you gave him heartburn and indigestion, but he gave you nothing. But, boy, listen. Oh, oh, anxiety. Slaves. They were slaves for 400 years until God set them free. God, listen, God always sets you free or you're never free. I don't care if it's human or, or, or spiritual. If God, listen, you're always a slave. Whether, and when God sets you free, you're never a slave. Listen, you ought to write this down, Galatians 5, 1 and 13. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. Five, 1 and 13. God freed them. Listen, here's the exodus. No appreciation for this. None. When you murmur, always murmuring against God, you have no appreciation of the grace of God that's brought you to where you are. God freed them by grace and promise from the slave bondage of Egypt after 400 years, Genesis 15, 13. But they were unwilling. That's called secondary negative volition. They were unwilling, unwilling. They knew it, but unwilling to accept it. They were unwilling to put off old man, cosmos diabolica slavery thinking of Egypt and put on new man, divine viewpoint, freedom thinking of promise of God. Think about that. See, you spend so much of your time in the bondage of the life you've been handed and not in the freedom of the other grace life that God has offered you. He saves you out of bondage. All kinds of stuff to, listen, to put you into a freedom state of existence with a grace principle that he will supply and take care of your needs. Philippians 4.19. And listen, if you want to cry against God, you can cry against it. He's going to make you demand you to understand what you're crying about. 
Listen, when you say, I don't have a father, a father God, then you lay a scripture up there that, that says that he'll take care of you. So you better know, you better know Philippians 4.19, that he will supply your, your needs. You better know something like Matthew, the sixth chapter in there when it says, our daily bread. Where's your daily bread come from? Don't be like the children of Israel. Well, somebody has to give it to me or I don't get it. Well, where'd you get to last time? Moses. You never got anything from Moses. God supplies all your needs, not man. You know, you know what they lived in? Well, you know, you know what? Well, you, you know what? Do you know what slavery taught the Egyptians? Welfare mentality. They lived in slavery so long, they thought somebody had to take care of them. That's how you get it. Let me tell you, got to take care of you. Take care of you. Take care of you better than anybody you could ever have in this whole world take care of you. If you're a believer. If you're a believer. And you know what they're complaining about? They're sitting and complaining about a pot of meat and bread. And let me tell you, they didn't get kosher stuff. We're not talking kosher. We're talking about roadkill throwing a pot and stale bread. These are slaves. They're not going to get. They're not going to get the first line. They're not going to eat. The Pharaoh's food. It's crazy. Welfare. No need to do that, people. You're children of God. You're children of God. Listen. Be charitable. Be charitable. There's a difference between welfare and charity. Listen, they left Egypt, but Egypt didn't leave them. Oh, I think my life would change if I could just move from here to here. If I just get rid of that guy and get this guy. If I could just do this and do that, my life would be changed. No, it won't. No, it won't. How many friends do you know? You, said, you try to talk them out of it. Go, don't go do that. Yeah, that's just, did it anyhow. Yeah. They wound up same same mess over here. They move out of state. Oh, that's probably the state. I need to go to west or go deep into the east or someplace. Go north. Well, my life will be different. It depends. Your life will be different when you decide to have your life be different. And listen, you need to put it in the hands of somebody that really does love you and has proved it by sending his son to die on a cross for your sins. Somebody that has already prepared you a home in eternity John 14, put your hands in that guy. He's, always, he's already got you set up for eternity and, and hasn't required one thing from you. Jeez. They were unwilling because of negative volition to free themselves, to free themselves, to free themselves from the bondage of their sin nature and their their cosmos diabolic, the way the world thinks. Quit thinking the way the world thinks and start thinking the way the Word of God thinks. You've been born again. Live like a born again person. The Bible is the most important book to your life. It's your roadmap in time and eternity. Romans 12, 2. Stop being conformed to the world. Live in transformation. Let God transform your life. Listen, I'm not, listen. Look, look, look. Stop listening to the world. He says, don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed. That requires all that God has to offer you under grace. Salvation, spiritual life, spiritual journey, rewards and eternal, all that. 
That's part of that package over here. Here's what people think. They think that they'll move from there, that they move from there to reformation. That's what they think. Well, I've got to reform my life to get over here. I go from conforming to reforming to transforming. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Nothing could be farther from the truth. You go from that's out, that's never considered, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, you go there. Oh, the world, listen, the world, listen. Stop being conformed to the world. Don't go to the world to reform yourself. Go to transformation where your life can actually be changed. Your life can act. Here's where, listen, there's no life change here. You have to conform to the way the world goes or they'll eat you for lunch. You ever run with a pack of the world? Pray tell me, listen, if you, if you didn't get saved till you were in the teens or 20s, I guarantee you you ran with packs. I did. Of course you run with them. It's called peer pressure and pack pressure. Of course you did. Listen, you conform to the world or you don't make it. They'll chew you up and throw you out. You want proof? Luke 15, the prodigal son. He went to the world. The world loved him as long as he had money and could, could you know, meet the bills. When he ran out of that, listen, and didn't want to do it, then they threw him out. They threw it. That's the way the world does. You have to conform to the world or they'll spit you out, chew up and spit you out. And if you think reforming is going to do it, it won't. That's another world system. This is the power system, is the gospel of Jesus Christ and transformation. A completely, a completely different prayer. You're no longer in Adam, you're now in Christ, and all that he is, you become. The transformation is the 20 status privileges in that little pamphlet of the 50 things you receive at salvation. You should read that. Transformation, that's who you are. It's who you are. It's not who you become. It's who you are. Those 20 status privileges is who you are in Christ, not who you become. It's who you are in Christ. Then you become the, who you are in Christ to the world, and your life is a light and an impact. Please tell me you understand this. Please tell me you're getting this. You've got to get this. The world sucks you up into these foolishness. I'll go from conform to reform to transform. It doesn't work that way. It's still a world system. Reforming is still a world system. It's a do-gooder type. You got, listen, transformation just read that little pamphlet. That's who you are now, not who you're going to become. That's who you are now. And that's where God wants to develop you. You're now that way as a baby, an immature and a mature believer. And when you hit that, you'll hit the stride in God. You will then understand that, and that will be a happy place for your heart. I'm not just a son of God. I am an active son of God. I'm not just a light. I'm, an, I'm a light. I am a light shining. I'm a shining light, not just a light. I'm a bright light. I'm a shining light. I mean, God even likes a light that, bl that blinks and is, is, you know, sometimes you turn your flashlight on, it's dim, a dim light. I mean, Let me close. I don't know where, where am I. The Israelites hated slavery and complained sin of the tongue to the Lord. At the right time in the plan of God, the Lord answered their prayer by the promise of the word of God of Genesis 15, 13. 
Listen, you know how long it took for God to answer that prayer? 400 years. Took him 400 years. Do you know? that on the day of the 400th year of slavery, on the day of the 430 years of being in Egypt, on the very day that God said, I'm going to release you, the Bible says, on the very day they came out in the Exodus, on the very day. Think about that. <laughs> On the very day, on the very day, you can read it. In, you can read it in Exodus 12, chapter 40, 41. Look at in Exodus, the third chapter, Moses at the burning bush. God answered their prayer right on time. I gave you the passage. It shows the sovereignty of God. Listen. God may wait, but he's never what? Late. Never late. He said, I have seen this 400 years. I have seen the afflictions of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard, I have, I have given heed to their cry. I am aware of their suffering. That's been for 400 years. Now I have come down on the very day that he said he would. Now I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians. I have come down to bring them up out of the uh, uh, from uh, bring them up from a land to a good spacious land to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now who wouldn't want to be on that team? Who wouldn't want to be on that team? Who wouldn't want to be on the team? Well, I'm going to let you work on the last point because I'm out of time. And now I'm on your time, not mine. Okay? So I'm going to try to honor that as much as I can. I can tonight. Well, let's close in a word of prayer, and then we'll have a short period of, uh, of prayer for ourselves if we need additional prayer from what we had last night. Our, our Heavenly Father, we are thankful for these who have come our way tonight by the automobile and the Internet. I speak to those from the Internet that are still with us. Uh, we're, we are thankful. Uh, find a night and stay with us. We're about to close out the book of uh, James. But I encourage you to stay with a night uh, with us for a year. If you uh, visited our Tuesday night, now you can go to all of them if you'd like. But especially stay. Don't be a surfer on the Internet with me. Stay with me. Stay with my Tuesday night. Stay in something and watch something progress or stay in a, a, a specific study would be my request to you. I pray the Lord would encourage your heart with the things we've talked about today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.